So, yeah, that's basically the villains I have planned for my upcoming movie. Wow. You're putting three villains into your movie? Isn't that a bit too much? Yeah, aren't you worried that you're sending a very bad message to the kids? The villain in your last movie was an overprotective mother who only loved and cared for her daughter. I don't think you're in any position to she talk- She turns into a giant red panda in the end. It's a great villain, you Okay, idiot. Pixar, let's calm down for a bit. DreamWorks, all we're saying is that the classic straight-up villain idea doesn't work anymore. It's all twist villains and generational trauma now. We've gotta move on. I mean, watch this. Pixar, show them your latest villain. Oh, no way! You're finally bringing the evil Emperor Zerg into the big screen? Guys, that's amazing! But isn't he a straight-up villain, though? Oh, sorry, wrong picture. That's Buzz Lightyear. Yep, he was Zerg all along. That... Doesn't make sense. What do you mean? It makes perfect sense. He goes back in time and tries to kill himself. What's so hard to understand about that? Well, first you fell right into a paradox where killing his past self would mean that he wouldn't have existed to travel back to kill himself in the first place. You do know that, right? Ah, shit. Okay, you know what? We're not taking any slander from you, alright? Remember, you're going up against Disney and Pixar here. It's gonna be tough to beat juggernauts like us. In fact, I have an amazing twist villain for my Strange World movie, and it's going to blow everyone's mind. Yeah, show him, Disney! That's a blank piece of paper. Exactly. It's gonna suck, isn't it? Oh yeah, it's gonna suck big time. <laughs> So I just watched Puss in Boots The Last Wish, the sequel to Puss in Boots from 2011, over a decade ago. Now don't get me wrong, the first movie was fine, it wasn't that great, but it wasn't that bad either. It passed the time, had a few chuckles here and there, but I didn't really leave the theater awed and amazed. And I will be honest here, I am one of those people who rolled their eyes the moment they got word that a Puss in Boots sequel was in the works. But hey, can you blame me? Did the first movie really make you go, hey, that was fun, I sure hope they make a sequel. No! If anything, it made us want a Shrek movie even more. I've already pointed this one out in my bad guys video, but DreamWorks has pretty much been on their deathbed as of recently. 2019 to 2021 was not a great stretch, guys. I'll be completely honest with you. It was not looking good. The moment you released the trailer for Spirit Untamed, I immediately lost hope. But I am happy to announce that I now have my official thoughts on DreamWorks' current state. And I'ma just say... Let them cook! I don't know how to explain it, but for me, I've always thought DreamWorks kinda had this firm grasp on what their target audience wants. For the most part. I mean, looking back at it, they pretty much own banger franchises. Shrek, How to Train Your Dragon, Kung Fu Panda, this is some good shit! And then they go and give us Boss Baby and we're back to square one. But I gotta say that Puss in Boots The Last Wish is probably the best animated movie I've seen in a while. You know what? No. Screw that. It's probably the best DreamWorks movie I've ever seen. And that's in the history of all DreamWorks movies. The animation is amazing, the characters are great, the jokes are hilarious, and the overall story feels so well paced and well written. DreamWorks basically figured out what their target demographic likes and they just straight up gave it to us. There are jokes with bleeps in here. Like FCC censorship bleeps. Drop the sh oh, the sh nugget. But that's not all. Each character here actually have a purpose and I actually enjoyed each of their storylines. But what is Puss in Boots The Last Wish all about? Well, the story is simple. Puss in Boots finds out that he's down to his last life, so he assembles a ragtag team to help him get those lives back before it's too late. Released back in December of 2022, Puss in Boots The Last Wish was one of the biggest surprises of the year. Not only did it do amazingly well in the box office, it was also critically and globally praised, being commended for its action, comedy, and animation. DreamWorks clearly took a few pages from Spider-Verse's book, but props to them, they actually managed to do it really well. Similar to Spider-Verse, one of my favorite things about the animation is how they also play with the frame rate, mirroring our hero's confidence by being smooth on one scene and being choppy when Puss finds himself in trouble. It's this cool little thing that I always thought translated really well into the story, so I'm glad Puss in Boots incorporated that concept here. I have tons more to say about this movie, so why don't we just go ahead and jump right in. Does Puss in Boots The Last Wish deserve all the praise, or is it simply an overhyped spin-off? 
Well, let's find out. This is DreamWorks Puss in Boots The Last Wish. Our movie starts off with quite possibly the best first 10 minutes ever in an animated film. You're off to a great start, DreamWorks. And I'm not kidding. The first 10 minutes of Puss in Boots is just... Right off the bat, they introduce a major plot device, the Wishing Star. And in a matter of seconds, they immediately tell you all you need to know about it. They tell you what it does, where it came from, where you can find it, then boom, title sequence. Just like that. We're introduced to our main character, Puss in Boots. After a few debacles, we actually have a pretty amazing action sequence that involved Puss fighting off guards with swords, then immediately escalate to taking down a giant. And yeah, the whole thing is pretty cool. Yeah, the giant kind of comes out of nowhere, but his appearance doesn't really affect the pacing in a negative way. In fact, he actually ups the ante. And I can't tell you just how much I love this fight. Right down to the animation, the music, the camera work, everything was done so well. Add in the little details sprinkled around that adds more reason for a rewatch. Like how the scene effortlessly transitions from nighttime to daytime. The wolf being in the crowd. Puss doing the signature air spin that he did in Shrek 2. Yeah, the whole sequence just works for me. It's really great. I just love a well choreographed and well thought out fight scene, you know? Oh, and all of this is happening, by the way, while the movie is playing an absolute banger. <laughs> Well, back to the movie, Puss manages to take down the giant and save the town. Also, I want to share that there's this move Puss does called the Spanish Splinter. It only happens like twice in the movie, but every time it does, it always catches me off guard and I always give the same reaction. Ooh! I call this one... The legend will never die! Yeah, so as all of you pretty much know, Puss dies during the fight and later on learns that he's now down to his last life. Liters. To draw out the evil humor. Oh, Doctor, by any chance, did those leeches make it into the writer's room of Strange World? I'm kidding, okay? That's the last joke about Disney, guys. I swear, I'll stop now. Unbothered by this news, though, he decides to continue his ways as a death-defying, fearless hero. Cut to Puss in Boots in the bar. Puss in Boots in the bar. What does that even mean? Though? That sounds weird. Cut to Puss in Boots in the bar later that day, and here we get what is quite possibly one of the best villain introductions ever to be put on film. Jesus Christ. I don't know who greenlit or even pitched the idea of death himself to be accompanied by that type of whistle, but whoever did, God bless you. We're introduced to one of our main antagonists, Wolf. Not the big bad Wolf. He's a whole different character and canonically a good guy now. This is just Wolf, who is pretty much also known as Death. And you gotta admit, He's a pretty badass character. I don't know what's up with DreamWorks and their villains, but whenever they get the opportunity to go overboard with how menacing their villain can be, they immediately do it. And they do it really well. The character design is great, by the way. They gave him bright red eyes to add on to the intimidation factor. Instead of a scythe, they gave him sickles, which is a very nice touch. And his accent really works well too. I am invested and afraid. Though Wolf is a pretty cool character, he's not really my favorite though, nor does he really steal the show for me. He's only kind of a big deal for Puss's story arc and not much else. We don't really get to know much about Death other than he just wants to kill Puss. But he does give a good reason to why he wants to kill him though, so I'll give him a pass. But they really should have worked on how he reveals himself as death though. I'm death. Straight up. How do you do, fellow kids? Could have just said I am death. Would have sounded cooler. But hey, that's just me. Well, anyways, we get this really good fight scene and Wolf happens to be too much for Puss to handle. Puss manages to escape though, but the near loss would convince him to finally retire being a hero and instead live the rest of his last life as a normal cat. Now at this point, a lot of things happen, so I'm just going to highlight key moments that I want to talk about. During his retirement, Puss ends up meeting a variety of characters. We're first introduced to our second antagonist, the group of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. And it's through them Puss finds out about 
about the wishing star. He then meets a dog named Perito, probably the second funniest character in the entire movie. Funny thing about Perito, the moment he came on screen, I 100% thought he was going to be annoying. He's clearly the comedic relief, so I legit thought Dreamers was going to Taika Waititi route and just mistake being annoying as funny. Press the button. Is it this button? I will tell you which button. Oh, what about this button? I'm sorry, we're not gonna have time to go over all the buttons. Okay, forget the button. What about this thing? Okay, that was the last joke about Disney, I pr- But to my surprise, Perito actually grows on you pretty quickly. Yeah, sure, at some point he talks a lot, but for some reason, you're not really bothered by it. Unlike some characters in some movies, he actually becomes a medium of trust between Kitty and Puss, and the writers did a great job naturally weaving it into the story rather than beating us over the head with it. Unlike some movies, his personality blends surprisingly well with Puss and Kitty being the only optimistic dumbass in the group. And what makes it better is that he actually provides help, knowing when to be funny and knowing when to cut the shit and have a serious moment. I mean, it's a comedic relief character that starts off with a throwaway line about being a therapy dog and actually end up making it come full circle by actually providing therapy. It's just really simple and smart writing. Speaking of comedic relief, later on we're introduced to the third and final antagonist, Jack Horner. Personally, my favorite character. He's just straight up a dick. Like there's no redeeming quality to this guy whatsoever and that's what makes him so fun. He's just an evil dude who wants to rule the world and DreamWorks just went with it. Now I know, I know, this contradicts to what I said about Hercule in my Luca video. And I'll admit, I may have been wrong. If a cliche can give me a character like Jack Horner, then I welcome that type of writing with open arms. But in my defense, Hercule wasn't funny. He was just sad. Because Jack Horner was very entertaining for me. So I cannot stress on how downright funny this character is. Not to mention he becomes even more funny once he gets Jiminy Cricket to be his conscience. It's a one-two combo that is straight up hilarious. Though Jack and his crew don't really get a lot of screen time, I think they got the perfect amount. Jack is obviously there to be the clear evil threat, so it's nice that they establish what he is and use the rest of the movie to flesh out the important and complex characters. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. And every joke that he delivers is on point. And you can credit both writers and John Mulaney's voice acting on that one. Yeah, John Mulaney. The same person who did this voiceover not too long ago. Dale, come on, don't, uh, don't prank me like this. <sighs> oh! That is two times Jack Horner has proved me wrong and I'm beginning to not like it. Anyways, back to the movie. We also welcome back Kitty softpaws. And basically the whole movie is a race to the wishing star. Each character having the intent on making the wish as their own. Except Perito. Now, on paper, just seeing the sheer amount of characters might give you the implication that the movie is going to be a complete overcrowded mess. But that's the thing you don't really feel that way at all. The movie does this really good job of balancing out all of its characters in terms of introduction, screen time, and storyline. Hell, we don't get to see Jack until we're 30 minutes into the movie and yet he still feels organically placed into the narrative. Granted, he does feel like he just tags along in the journey in the beginning. The scene of him riding off the battle kinda caught me off guard. I just thought he was going to be some random dude who got stolen from, but nope. He's actually the main villain. Which kinda makes sense, it was his map anyway, so... And I doubt Dreamers would pay John Mulaney just for a quick cameo. But then again, they did cast Jackie Chan as a character who barely had any lines, so I guess we're at an impasse. I don't really know you that well. I don't know what you are. We need to start to get to know each other more. So with that, the chase is on. Puss and the gang manage to find the location of the star deep in the dark forest, only to have Goldie and the bears follow suit and Jack Horner not so far behind. And let me point out that the map is an amazing plot device. It adds a few details that works really well with the character's personality and their storyline. Because the map does this thing where it changes landscapes whenever someone different holds it and it bases it off the holder's desires and insecurities. And let me tell you, this map adds so much layer of depth that you can't help but appreciate the attention to detail the writers went through. Like, the best example for this was when Goldie gets a hold of the map and it immediately suggests her this. To find your wish, adjust your view. What you seek may be right in front of you. If you guys didn't know, her wish was for her to have her own family. Kind 
of on the nose on that one, DreamWorks, but so far I'm having a great time, so I'll give you a pass. And the little details that no one seems to notice is how the map insists that Goldie not make the wish. The first was in their hallucination when she opens her book and it literally spells out, you already have it. Which is kinda corny, DreamWorks, not gonna lie. But props to you for actually making it subtle though. And then the map does it again by sending her on an endless loop around the forest. And when she does double down on it, the map basically just said, here bitch, damn! And showed her the way. I'm getting a family! That's what? A proper family! Then everything will be just right! Here bitch, damn! Yeah, let's talk about Goldie and the Bears for a second here. Though I do love Jack Horner's character, Goldie and the Three Bears definitely stole the show for me. Though Puss, Kitty, and Perito are the main focus and Jack is hilarious, the heart really did go to Goldie and her family. They have this running gag that's very on brand for their fairy tale. You know, the classic too small, too big, just right thing? Yeah, they do that. Like, a lot. They used that joke right off the bat and I'll be honest, it immediately got a chuckle out of me. I don't know why, it was just funny in context. Funny thing here is usually a movie suffers when they use the same joke over and over again. But to the movie's credit, they used Just Right as an emotional element to their story as well. It's actually pretty amazing how DreamWorks snuck in three different types of villains into their movie and none of them feel out of place. Even having one of them be redeemable and not gonna lie, got me to tear up a little bit. But I did, Mama. I did get my wish. Everything is just right. God damn it! Am I really crying over Goldilocks and the three goddamn bears? After encountering a few problems, Puss would finally make way for the wishing star, only to have a change of heart and instead chooses to be the better man, no longer running away from death, but instead faces him head on. There's this whole quick fight scene that happens on top of the star, and Goldie, I don't know if you knew this, but you can still grab the map and save Baby Bear at the same time, I'm just saying. But yeah, a whole fight breaks loose and Puss and Goldie work together to take down Jack Horner. The map gets destroyed, Puss manages to take down Wolf, Jack Horner dies, Goldie realizes she already has a family, I fucking cried again on the rewatch, are you kidding? Kitty now has someone to love and trust, and Perito finally has a name and people to call his friends. You know, to be honest, Jumper is pretty good. Yeah, but no. And just like that, we end with Puss and the gang sailing back to far, far away. And to see some old friends. And that was Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. What else can I say? It's really good. The animation is amazing, the voice acting is great, the story is simple yet very investing, the characters are super likable and fun, and the jokes are well delivered, well thought out, and well balanced. The movie pretty much hit all the right notes on this one, knowing to read the room when it matters. Sure, when a funny scene comes along, they're funny, but when it gets emotional, they stay emotional. DreamWorks clearly put their heart and soul into this one, which is no surprise since it is a sequel and DreamWorks pretty much go hard on sequels. I don't know why they do that, but please keep doing it. Thank you. This movie could have 100% been a complete dumpster fire if not handled right. But luckily, instead of a shameless cash grab of an existing IP, DreamWorks managed to create something fun and unique all while expanding their world. Overall, Puss in Boots is without a doubt one of the best animated movies I've seen in a while and hands down one of my new favorites. Which is why I'm giving Puss in Boots the last wish a 10 out of 10. That's today's video. Thanks for watching. Have a great day and a great life and I'll see you all next time. Bye.